Hello, I'm Tim. Welcome back. This is Watchbox Studios at the 1916 Company. I'm your host for Watches Tonight. This evening we have Sean and we have Sid on the switcher. We've got Edward in the box, Enrique and Arto. Always good to see our friends online. This evening I answer your watch collecting questions. We shop Tudor watches and I pick some favorites. We chat live and I share your viewer wrist shots right here tonight on Watches Tonight. Guys, if you enjoy this program, the party continues on my Instagram. I always talk about it, but it's never the same page. Updated several times daily, it's one minute videos of the best watches we've got right here, including some that are not on our website, so that's the only way you're gonna know we have them. Reach out, help me fill the gap, Tim underscore Masso on Instagram. All right, viewer wrist shots number one. Zachary V braves the Chicago cold with his 1916 sourced Alanko und Zona Zeitwerk. Thank you for trusting our company and that is the exact example I reviewed on my channel. Dr. Lodi of Lake Charles, Louisiana rocks and rolls. Rockin' with Grand Seiko and rollin' with the Ferrari GTC4 Luso. Very cool. Joel B submits a his and hers with his 1916 sourced Moser Swiss Alp watch and its literal inspiration. Also Rick from Manhattan impresses with a gorgeous Blancpain Le Mans flyback chronograph if only Audemars Piguet had a dress watch that elegant. Vin C of Boston tempts fate with a Rolex root beer GMT that recently survived a motorcycle wipeout. It looks pretty good. I have to say no worse for wear. Guys, send your wrist shots. To Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on my pixels. Let's see who's in the box. Okay, in addition to Edward, Enrique, Arto, we have Jim Millet, our friend from the opposite side of the Atlantic, Mateo. We've got Slowboy, we've got Joseph Zamora, we've got John Goodman, Robert Dixon from Scotland, David R. from Washington, D.C., A.D. Never Calling, Ivar Alessio from Dallas, McLauder from Holland, staying up late with us in continental Europe, and Lazy Guitar Guy, Ankit and Croy2121 from Singapore getting up early with us. I really appreciate that. We have Dr. Stu, Dan CT, and longtime friend Mark S. with Baltimore Spirits. Both of those guys have been with me for a long time. All right, jumping into this evening's topic, Rolex watches. Neither, well, are they, I don't know how to say this, guys, but Tudor is the new Rolex. And here's why I say that. Because Tudor watches are now the equivalent of Omega. And here's how we get there. So, there was a time not long ago, as recently as 2010, when Tudor watches felt like Rolex's answer to Longines, to Oris, perhaps a tool watch like Zinn or Fortis. In other words, entry-level luxury, luxury but entry-level luxury, and not appear to Rolex itself or its traditional rivals like Omega or Breitling. But something strange happened in the 2010s, and the parent company went far up market, so much so that last year the average Roller retailed for something like 13,300 Swiss francs worldwide. Which means, speaking of the Tudor of today and its sister's upmarket march, the one-time value brand is looking more like a true luxury nameplate. While value remains its strong suit, here's the thing, we can compare Tudor to the likes of Omega, Breitling, and in some cases even really upmarket rivals like IWC, Panerai, JLC, and Zenith, and we're going to do that tonight. So let's look at everything Tudor does that Big Brother doesn't. This is where it sets itself apart, not just in price, but also in character. Starting with the GPHG entries, you gotta be in it to win it. Tudor dares and won 2023 sports watch category with the Pelagos 39. Notably not in the contest, mm-hmm, you guessed it. Tudor does vintage tributes. Tudor does retro watches, unabashed. Big Brother, not so much. Some of these, including tributes to Big Brother's own past models. The best Explorer 2 Revival watch is actually the Tudor Black Bay Pro GMT. And customer movements for rival brands in the industry. This is probably the most fascinating thing from a industry nerd standpoint. It is that you can buy a Tudor movement and get it in your watch. Many have done so through Kinesi, the Tudor 
Movement Factory in Le Loque, Switzerland. We have Chanel. We have Breitling. We have Fortis. We have Norcane. We have Tag Heuer. We have Bell & Ross. All of them using these Tudor Kinesi movements, which first debuted back in 2015. This is fascinating. Go ahead, guys. Try to get yourself a caliber 3235. See what the man in Geneva says. I'm guessing it's not going to happen. Also, Tudor embraces occasional use of customer calibers in its watches. It still uses ETA in some model lines, but it actually brings us to a genre that Omega and Breitling have to themselves, which is the diving chronograph. And this is where I would say Tudor shows an open-mindedness to bring in the best caliber for the purpose. First, a note about diving chronographs. You won't find this kind of watch across Pont Hans Wilsdorf in Geneva, and you can guess which factory you'll find there. But Tudor packs a wicked diving chronograph in the Alinghi Red Bull Racing Pelagos FXD chronograph. And this is a summer 2023 launch, 43 millimeters in diameter, with a case in forged carbon, a very different thing you won't find at the sister brand, a bezel insert of ceramic, a bezel that is titanium, and a fully loomed diving bezel insert on that titanium bezel. I would say, ironically, power for this one comes by way of Breitling. This is why I say they bring in the best customer calibers when they need to. It uses a Breitling movement that it dubs MT5813, and Tudor makes the movement its own with specific finishing that matches its other watches, a anti-magnetic silicon hairspring, a free-sprung balance, and a dial with a 45-minute register rather than the Breitling B01's standard 30-minute register. So there are some differences here, and they make worthwhile upgrades, but they keep everything that's great about the Breitling movement, including the 70-hour power reserve, the column wheel vertical clutch tandem, and the COSC chronometer certification, all of this in a special edition tutor that truly does look special, that's $5,275. Go ahead, check to see what Audemars Piguet will charge you for a carbon chronograph, or Hublot for that matter. By comparison, the likewise yachting-themed Omega Seamaster Diver 300 meter regatta costs an insane $11,900 and measures 44 by 17.2 millimeters, unwearably sized, unless you have the wrist of Thor. This thing is even larger than 17.2. I know because I've measured it. It's closer to 18. If you can wear the Tudor, don't assume you can wear this. Not by a long shot. Even a standard version of this chrono without the regatta features costs $8,600 on a bracelet and it's still $8,200 on a strap like the Tudor. Omega used to be known for good value, but with prices like this compared to Tudor, Omega value is seriously in question, and it is all to Tudor's advantage at this point. So, before we jump any further, let me remind you that the Tudor uses high-tech materials. It has a longer power reserve by 10 hours than the Omega. It matches the Omega's five-year warranty, and the Tudor bezel can actually be gripped with a wet hand and used when you're wearing gloves. All of this is important because the shallow knurling on the Diver 300 meter is almost impossible to budge. And it has been since the beginning, because I'm wearing the original right here, and this thing almost requires a rubber latex glove to turn the bezel. The Tudor, not so much. Viewer wrist shots number two. Before we jump in, let's see who's in the box. We got Mark S. Where is the full bridge on the MT5813? Mark, they do a silicon hairspring and a free sprung conversion. They don't go full bridge, probably because they would have to redesign all the adjacent bridges and the base plate to make that work. And there's only so much built into that Tudor profit margin for those kind of changes. What else is going on? Cull Obsidian saying, if I didn't have an Explorer 2, I'd probably get a Black Bay Pro. They're fantastic. Only shame is the lack of a white dial. How cool would it be if they did a cream dial on those? How cool would that be? The Easy Rail, ETA smiley black bays have become collectible items. You're also certain those will be serviceable until eternity, and that is a fact. Especially the Black Bay Black that was out for like a few months at the end of 2015, I think it was. Yeah, that's a very collectible watch. 
Luke Watson joining in. Good evening, Luke. Good to see you there. Cull Obsidian saying, if only it didn't have the Alinghi on the Rehot, I would be all over it. It is very subtle. Give it a chance. And we have Yuki saying, finally catching a live stream for once. What's up, Tim and everyone? What's up, Yuki? It is great to see you in the chat box tonight. Welcome, guys. Okay, wrist shots number two. Now we're doing it. Andrew K. And his Grand Seiko Quartz GMT. They scout Barcelona for business and pleasure. You know, Grand Seiko design-wise has often been about more for more's sake. And there we go with Gaudi and Gran Seiko proving that when in the hands of a master, that can actually be a winning style. Okay, Danny Kay reports from Lucerne, Switzerland with a rare ETA-powered Tudor Pelagos. We were just talking about those. Mark dodges traffic while piloting his IWC Pilot's Watch Chronograph Edition AMG. See what I did there? Abdul R of Germany pierces the cold with January sun and his Lyrique Etudie numero 1. Marcio of Richmond, Virginia, he's in Brazil. Going to Brazil, that was a great track off 1916 by Motorhead. And, and Marcio went to Brazil with his IWC Pilot's Watch Mark 20. Looking good, guys. Send your wrist shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your watch on this box. That figure of speech is not going to be as useful now that we are the 1916 company, but the nomenclature transition will not be complete until April, so I can still use it. All right. Fun from the UK. I'm thinking about an IWC Ingenieur. Got one on offer from London at retail. What do you think? I think the current Ingenieur is very expensive. I think the old true Genta Ingenieurs, like the 3508 or the 1832, the 1832 is probably going to cost more than the reborn Ingenieur from last year. But I still think its value compared to, say, a Nautilus or Royal Oak from the period, or even a Vacheron 222. But I would say look into the 1832 if you could spend a little bit of extra money, or the 3508, the 500,000 ampere per meter. Unless you're just in love with the new model from 2023, I really think you get better value with the vintage watches because they will not depreciate and they will actually gain over time. I also think they have more historical value. 24 degrees. Hello from Greenwich, London. And John claude Beaver, any thoughts on the new Zenith triple calendar? Uh, I like it. I, I'm not exactly in love. I, I'm not in love. That's the problem. There are a lot of watches I like, but love is when you buy, and I do not love. Okay, Tudor watches taking the fight to high horology. Speaking of Zenith and brands of that ilk and that echelon, Jaeger Lecoult is known for two iconic series, the Reverso rotating watch on one hand and the Memovox alarm on the other. In fact, the Memovox launched only seven years before Tudor's advisor. Memovox came out in 1950, the advisor in 1957. And it spawned a modern counterpart, the advisor did back in 2011. Now the JLC, which you can buy today, it's a fine watch, $14,300, not a bad price for what you get. It's a beautiful classic piece and very, very practical. It's a good value by 2024 standards among watches and pricing today. And of course, there's no equivalent of it in the house of the crown. So if you go with Tudor's big brother, alarm watches, not an option. But not only Tudor does have an answer to the JLC, and they do, uh, but it has several, of which the 2016 Cognac dial is by far the most charismatic and desirable, at least to me. You can get silver, you can get black, or you can get the Cognac dial, and I think that one, which came out in 2016, the rarest one, is also the best. Part steel and part titanium, because this is a chiming watch, those metals were picked for their sonic qualities. The modern Heritage Advisor is a 42 millimeter all-arounder, neither sports watch nor dress watch. It's got a dial side power reserve for the alarm, on-off functionality, so you can disarm the alarm if you wish to do so. And yes, enough punch to wake you even with earplugs in, which I consider essential for traveling. There's also a date, 100 meter water resistance, which the JLC cannot match, and a bit of loom too, which makes it very practical. 
Mechanically, this was, and I believe remains, the most complex Tudor watch ever made with an ETA2892 base combined with the Tudor complication module to give the watch a level of technical appeal rarely seen on Tudor's otherwise basic mechanisms. Now, it launched at 6000 for the strap model for the Cognac, and a bracelet was offered for only $225 more. Intriguingly, there was also a still available Tudor factory silk strap made for this model, which I would absolutely add just to have it. Although no longer in production, these can be found all day long on Chrono 24 for $5,000, even less than $5,000, especially on a strap. So you have superb choice at well below retail. And unlike a bunch of newly sprung micro brands that play in this price range, the machine inside is as interesting as the style on the outside, and Tudor gives you the absolute certainty that the brand will be around forever to provide parts and service for that watch. Okay, jumping into the chat, let's see what you guys are saying right now. We have Abdul joining in saying that Tudor Advisor is awesome for someone with a large wrist, and I agree. Awesome for someone with a large wrist. It wears more like a 43, more like a 44. It is big. And check my videos of this because I've done a couple of videos of them. We have Suleiman joining in. Hi, Tim. Are you going to do a review of the Grubel 4C GMT Balancier Convex? Yes, but I have to make sure it's here. Sometimes these watches on our website are actually at other 1916 locations. We got Truman B saying, Hi, Tim. Chopard Alpine Eagle over IWC Ingenieur all day long, yes. We have Taddy Nut Nut joining in from Germany, staying up late with us, which I appreciate, saying I love the one minute watch reviews. And if you like the one minute watch reviews, guys, follow me on Instagram. We have Ronald saying best value ceramic watch outside Bathyscaf and Tudor. I would remind you that there are also a lot of ceramic Omegas, including Diver 300 meters, that are great timepieces to own. And we have Jesse R. joining from the Motor City in Detroit. And we have Ivar saying, Tudor Pelagos greater than Rolex Yachtmaster 42 Titanium. Hmm, we're gonna explore that now. But first, viewer wrist shots number three. Gabriel and his Grand Seiko SBJ401 Boutique Edition Spring Drive are ready for all roads in his Jeep. John G. explores the American West with his Ball Engineer 3 Outlier GMT. Guys, keep these landscape shots coming, please. Warren buzzes the tower with an impressive collection of pilot's watches from Breitling, IWC, and Omega. Jimmy Y takes us back a few weeks with holiday cheer and his Rolex Batman along with a Disney holiday show. Scott B takes us further back to his Omega Seamaster Aquaterra Golf Edition and the peak of fall colors. Send your wrist chats to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your analog on my digital. Let's jump into the box and see what you guys are saying because this is an interactive experience. Bullet 411. Let's chalk that, let's hit that like button, guys. Please do. I always do my best to try to get the live chat going because I feel like we get the best interaction with the live chat going in circular fashion. And I also get the best concurrent viewership when I'm chatting with you guys. Saeed's joining in. Good to see him. BNS, well, who made it? And we're glad to have you here. Luke Watson saying, I love the Tudor advisors. I look at them many times, but I never pulled the trigger and I kind of regret it. Look at the new Tudor advisors. All also look at the older ones made in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. A lot of those are actually manual wind, but if you have a problem with the size of the new one, you're gonna find that those are a really good match. And it's a very practical type of watch to own. Almost everyone who goes vintage Tudor goes big block chronographs, they go Tudor Submariners, they go big crowns, no crown guard, they go snowflakes, all different ways to collect vintage Tudor, Monte Carlos, but the best way to do it is the Heritage Advisor because you don't have to compete with people who are vintage dealers, who are retro snobs, or who are quote unquote professional collectors. So go for the Advisor, get all of the vintage Tudor experience with none of the, I, I would say, hornet's nest of Franken watches and counterfeits that populate the other 
more in-demand Tudor vintage spaces. I also think that 90s and 2000s Tudor right now is underrated, and we're going to explore that in a moment, because right now everyone's interested in the true vintage from like the Rolex case era and back and the modern era from like 2012 when the Black Bay debuted. Very little interest from say 1999 to about 2011. And I think that's where opportunities lie. Thomas Burnett, we have Fabian Cruz joining in from Atlanta, which I love. I used to live right outside Atlanta in Woodstock. We got Marco D saying, love the new Black Bay 41 with the five link bracelet. Nick Harrison's in the box. We got Brooks saying, should I buy a Tudor or save up for a Rolex? I would say whenever you have to choose between something that costs more and something that costs less, ask yourself this question. If you buy the thing that costs less, are you settling? Because if you are, then I can tell you what's going to happen. You're going to buy the Tudor, and then you're also going to buy the Rolex. And without fail, this is exactly what happens every time. You can't get the bug out of your mind. You realize that you made a compromise. And in the end, you're still going to go to all of the social media and the forums and the websites that remind you of the watch you wish you had. So instead of making an economical choice and buying the less expensive watch, you're going to make the worst financial choice, which is to get both of them. And if you don't want both of them, that means you're going to spend more money and you're probably going to sell the tutor and then lose money on it. So I would say try both watches in person, then you will know whether it's worth saving up for the Rolex or whether you'd be happy with the tutor. Sometimes these questions answer themselves. Tutors tend to be a little bit larger. It might wear differently. You may not like the way it looks or you might fall in love. So I would make that choice based on first-hand experience. Luke Wilson saying, love the advice, we'll definitely look into those. Track and Trace saying, the Tudor Fast Rider chronograph with yellow dial is a striking, iconic watch. I think the Fast Riders and the Fast Rider Black Shields are really interesting. There was this whole class of Tudor chronos during the 2010s that were mostly motorsports oriented, some cars, some motorcycles, and they just didn't have the same market that the vintage inspired watches did. So they sold in relatively low lower volumes, meaning they're uncommon, and everyone doesn't have one. So definitely look into that, because a lot of those Tudor chronos from the 2010s are very distinctively Tudor watches, and there's strong visual links between them and the Tudor chronos of the 70s and 80s, and that's a really cool thing, because not everyone's into vintage watches, but it's still good to acknowledge heritage, and I think those Tudor chronos of the 2010s that were not the heritage chrono, that were not the heritage chrono blue, I think those are really great watches that are underappreciated right now. Norm M saying, I have my dad's 1960s Tudor, Norseman that you have featured, Tim. That is very cool. Keep sending your wrist chats. Hi, Tim. Frederic Piguet, 1185 versus Zenith El Primero. Which is the better movement? Well, I'm going to say this. The Piguet is a more modern movement. It is a vertical clutch. It is always at least five position adjusted. It is incredibly compact. I want to say the Piguet is like 25.6 millimeters by like 5.56, which makes it incredibly thin for an automatic integrated chrono. It is a high horology movement. It is used by Breguet, Blancpain. It has been used by Vacheron, Audemars Piguet. There's no question that if you want the haute horlogerie option and you're not getting some kind of El Primero tourbillon or perpetual calendar or skeleton watch, uh, definitely the Piguet is the finer movement. But if you want something that's tough, El Primero. You want something historically important, the El Primero has the edge. You want something with a longer power reserve, all versions of the El Primero are going to be at least 10 hours longer than the Piguet. And I would also say both column wheel movements, the El Primero column wheel feel is better. Plus, I would also say that it better fills a display case back. It is a bigger movement. And it is also capable of being chronometer certified, which it often is. I really can't think of too many applications of the Piguet in which it's also a chronometer. Uh, so that's very important to remember. And at the end of the day, if you want a Rolex blessed version of either of those, only the El Primero found its way into a Rolex. And back in the 1990s, when the Piguet was the more modern movement, having been created in the 80s, not the 60s, Rolex chose the El Primero for its watch, and I think that speaks 
just huge volumes about its quality, both as a timekeeper and as a lasting tank that can basically stand up to anything. What else is going on? We have Nick Harrison saying, I miss the North flag, and so do I. The North flag, which came out in 2015, officially launched Tudor in-house calibers. It was way ahead of its time, a steel integrated bracelet sports watch with a tonneau style case. It also incorporated a complication in the power reserve indicator. Lightly vintage inspired, it was more than anything a very modern watch, which meant it didn't square well with Tudor's modern mean of vintage re-editions and retro-inspired divers. So it didn't last long and it's already discontinued, but I feel like if it had been strung along a little longer and if maybe they'd expanded the line, it would have been a very successful watch because it's really a watch for our moment. It was just too far, maybe four or five years even ahead of its time. Now we have integrated bracelet sports watches from everyone, including Grubel Forsey at the top of the market to the likes of Tissot with the PRX at the bottom. And I think that the North flag had it come out last year or this year would have been a huge hit. So Baruch asking, is Tudor garbage? No, I wouldn't say Tudor's garbage. I, I think that's a little bit weird. Um, I've never had any experience with Tudor that was less than luxury. And I can tell you I've experienced a lot of watches that are considered to be high horology that were absolutely garbage. A bunch of MCTs that didn't work. And we'll, we'll talk offline on my Facebook group when we chat this Wednesday, guys. We'll talk about some other watches that were very expensive and very touted and did not work well. I've never experienced a Tudor watch that didn't work well, with one exception. The original Black Bay GMT had all sorts of weird issues with the date advance. And we found this almost immediately and Tudor did damage control. They addressed the problem. They warrantied the watches, but it was a weird misstep out of the box and they don't do a lot of those. Mark S saying the North flag is an automatic with power reserve pointless. I always thought that a power reserve is just an extra feature. So if more equals better, I thought it was a fun complication and a very friendly one. If you got to remember to wind a watch, it doesn't matter whether it's automatic or manual. Some people just wind their watches in their watch box when they need doing. And not everyone wears every watch every single day. Jag Productions joining in from Singapore and saying, I would love a Tudor Chrono though. There's a lot of Tudor Chronos out there, so decide whether you want something that's more compact and vintage or you want something a little bit more modern, because even the Heritage Chrono and the Heritage Chrono Blue are pretty big on the wrist. Brap Lab joining us from the left coast in San Francisco. Abdul R saying, would love to see a reissue of the vintage Tudor Submariner 94, 439 millimeters. That would be really killer. I agree with that. And I would also say it would be interesting to see a reissue of a Tudor Submariner period, because they have steadfastly resisted making a Submariner. And I think there's a reissue reason for that that's hard and fast, which is that Tudor and Rolex don't share cases anymore. And the Tudor Submariner pretty much went away with the era of shared cases. When Rolex went to 904L steel, Tudor did not follow it. And so Rolex stopped making Tudor cases, case backs, bracelets, and clasps. And I think if there were still shared cases, you would see a Tudor Submariner. I don't think you can turn the clock back because that sharing of componentry will never be repeated. Uh, what else is going on? Mick in Florida saying, I serviced my watch. It is an Abel 1911, one of the best values out there. I think he's talking about El Primero's. Jason Reeves joining in from Long Island. We've got Rakesh dialing in from Paris and staying up late with us. Truman Burbank saying, the issue in the MT calibers is that they are a little too thick like the Omegas. That is definitely true. And I think like Omega, you're going to start to see manual adaptations of the MTs, just as we've seen manual adaptations of the 8900s and the 9900s to try to deal with the thickness issue. Also, some of them like the MT5400s that you'll find in the Black Bay 54s and Black Bay 58s, 
Those are not super thick. Those are a lot more livable and they don't give up anything in power reserve capability or durability. Eric Nielsen joining in late, but here for the finality, we are not done, Eric. Rod Salvador saying, most interesting of the current models at Tudor, Black Bay 58 Bronze, P01, and Pelagos left-hand drive. Okay, that's a great transition point to the crazy stuff no one does in our show. So speaking of crazy stuff no one does, we're talking about things Tudor does that not only does Rolex not do, but not a whole lot of other companies do, period. Tudor is well known for standard steel black bays, heritage chronos, and occasional black bay chronographs and GMTs, but the company also takes some wacky risks, and the results are among its most memorable models. And we're gonna start with the 2021 Pelagos FXD Marine Nationale. Okay. A modern day military contract watch with a mechanical movement. Almost unheard of. I thought it was interesting when the Zin Easy M1 and the Zenith Rainbow Flyback back in the 90s were actually purchased on military or uniformed services contract. I thought that was pretty much the end of the mechanical watch made for uniformed services in anything other than symbolic roles. But this watch is actually used not just by the French Navy, but by the elite Commando Hubert tactical amphibious squad. And the watch was largely designed to fit their requirements. Now, people get very bent out of shape over the MN21s, but the reality is that all of these integral lug French military divers are born special. I, I will say this though, if you want the most collectible, the less than two month production span of the Pelagos FXD MN21, and that's what it looks like, makes it interesting from a scavenger hunter's perspective, but the very idea of owning a mechanical watch still accepted and used by combat personnel, that is the true heart of the FXD's appeal, which is to say that is why you buy it. The loom can light a room, and notice, unlike a Rolex bezel here, the full bezel is loomed, not just the bezel pearl, which makes it much more useful than, say, a sub or a sea dweller, and, because it is the Marine Nationale, it has a fully calibrated bezel, so you get individual minutes all the way up to, well, this is the thing that's really interesting here. Not 60, but zero, because this is a countdown bezel, a little bit like Zinn's Mission Timer, and very, very cool on that basis. So everything about this watch is different, though you can't see it here. The lugs are continuous and integral with the case. So along with the no-date dial, this is a very distinctive product. I would say that this is probably the coolest Pelagos that doesn't have a left-hand crown right now. And if you're a Navy fan, U.S. Navy, they've got one that is U.S. Navy diver inspired, but this Marine Nationale is the real deal, military used. Okay, Black Bay 58 AG925. This one kills me, because even back in 2021 when this came out, people were asking, is the Black Bay played out? Have they run out of ideas? Basically, has panorysis set in. And panorysis is a very severe condition when a brand is dependent on a few strong styles and core model lines that by nature can't change too much. So here's the thing. They knocked it out of the park with this. No one was asking for a sterling silver Black Bay 58 with a taupe dial and matching bezel. They absolutely hit it out of the park to use an American baseball idiom. This watch was as revolutionary and unexpected in 21 as the Panerai Bronzo PAM 382 was back in 2011. And here's the thing, the Tudor, unlike that Panerai, can still be purchased for reasonable money. Considering a precious metal case and tooling that's probably only used on this model, that's a very reasonable price for a lot of watch. It proved that Tudor's Black Bay lineup had yet to peak and still had room to grow. The only wart here, and this is a controversy that is invisible as long as you keep it on your wrist, a poorly judged display case back. Tudor, please take a look at how excited people got at the FXD's MN21 engravings and realize that a well-executed solid case back can be a better option than a view of a crudely finished machine. And here's the thing, the running gear in these Tudor watches is very tough, very accurate, very well made from a mechanical standpoint, but it looks ugly 
It looks as ugly as an unfinished LaMagna 5100, and I have no problem covering up these Tudor MT series manufacturer movements and accepting gratefully their impressive specs without having to see them. All right, let's see what's going on in the box. Okay, James Sharon saying, hot take, I'd rather take a marathon TSAR search and rescue over the Tudor Marine Nationale. And you know, the way to do this is to get one from a veteran who will write out a little testimony saying, yes, I wore this, I was a Cobra pilot, I wore this thing while flying off, you know, a landing helo deck or on deployment. Here's a photo of me wearing the watch in Iraq. If you want to get one of those marathon GSAR, TSAR, MSAR, get it with a testimonial from the Marine or soldier or airman or or guardsman or sailor who actually owned it first. Because to me, that's the coolest thing about the story of those watches. Real servicemen do use them. Karate Chop saying, Panerysis, I'll steal that one. Steal it with my blessing. I'm happy to coin a, coin a phrase. I, I, I've coined a couple and regretted it. I think that one actually has purpose and, and utility in the community. Uh, okay, what else is going in the box? Arturo. The other option I have is a Rolex GMT black dial, 116710, but I do not know, will it increase in value? Probably. Probably. Everything can be bought at the top of the market and realize a loss in the short term. But I think if you pay market rate for a core watch and you know it wasn't owned by Jackie Onassis Kennedy or something, or Jackie Kennedy Onassis or Taylor Swift or some crazy thing, if you just go out and buy a generic GMT six digit, I think you'll be fine. Get it with the box, get it with papers, get it unpolished, keep it for 20 years, you can't lose. If you're worried about what it'll be worth next year, Playing the market is probably not for you. Wait to get one at retail, and then you truly can't lose. Ira Wolf, CWC SBS is still issued today. Good to know. Dr. Stu saying, too small and unfinished pedestrian movements should never be on display. That's particularly true with Oris watches that use Salida and ETA calibers. We have Dan S. Thought on the Tudor Tiger series. I think they're interesting because they're from that era of Tudor watch that is currently on no collector's radar, but a lot of those watches are very cool, nicely sized, and will be collectible in my opinion. Okay, controversial watches. This is where it takes guts to take a risk in this business. 2008's Iconaut. This is that era of watches that I'm saying is not being collected by Tudor guys right now. 2008's Iconaut isn't well remembered since it sold poorly, preceded the launch of the brand in North America, which was generally considered to be the initial resurrection of Tudor. The strength in North America really propelled it globally. And the Iconaut didn't fit with Tudor's subsequent identity as a purveyor of retro style watches. But the 43 millimeter GMT chronograph is an excellent product that offers tremendous value today. Take a look at those prices. Under three grand for all that capability? Yes, please. Now, Black Bay 58 18 carat. Not just an 18 carat Black Bay, guys, but yellow gold, no less. In 2021, people gasped at the price of this monster, which costs $2,400 more than a full bracelet steel gold Submariner date. And yet, the 18 carat is gorgeous. They took it in good taste with a green dial, green bezel, no high polish, satin finish. Get over the idea of a Tudor that's priced like a Ducati Super Sports, and there's no denying that this is just a beastly looking 39 millimeter watch with a rare green dial that will remain cool long beyond our green dial moment, which feels like it is in its 15 minutes of fame. Its 15th minute is now. Its 11th hour is upon us. I don't think the green dial thing will endure beyond this model year, but that green dial will look great in 50 years. I've always opined that yellow gold works best with smaller watches, vintage watches, and the contrasting warmth of some sort of a dark leather strap. This model hits all of those touchstones, suggesting the art department had true command of its subject matter. While price remains dizzying, the aftermarket for this watch is ready to provide some relief for those who wish to test the waters of the richest of Black Bays. Okay, 
Jumped into the box right here. A Mick in Florida saying, love the Tigers. Another series of collectibles. Alex H. saying, I enjoy thick watches. Laugh out loud. Guess I'm a bit different. I have Seawolf first edition Cobra yellow dial wing logo. I never take it off. The weight is reassuring. All the best. Glad to see it in the box, my man. It's good to have an opinion that's different. Okay. Amit K. saying, if green goes away this year, what's next? Difficult to say, but I would not be shocked to see powder-coated cases or CVD cases. Basically, if we go from colorful dials to, to an era of colorful cases, PVD, CVD, powder coat, enameling, I would not be shocked to see Cerakote make its debut on cases in the luxury space. Okay, weird things from Tudor, Black Bay P01. Roughly once a year, I return to the P01, which is probably the most polarizing modern Tudor watch. My affection for it never dims, and every time I come back to it, I notice something new that I didn't see the first time. First, let's air out everything that's wrong here. It wasn't the Tudor Submariner people thought they were getting in 2019. There was a social media campaign. People thought they were getting a Tudor Sub. It turned out to be this, big backlash. Despite a nominal 41 millimeter size rating here, it's actually huge and hard to wear. It was nothing like a 41. Think 44, think 45, now you've got the idea. Most people aren't aware or nostalgic about the vintage US Navy intended prototype that inspired the P01. There it is right there. Almost no one knew about this watch before the 01 came out. In other words, there was not a hue and cry for its reissue. The standard leather strap on the P01 is an odd and inconvenient choice for a dive watch, which makes this already sort of Marmite watch even more so. And the 12 hour bezel is far less useful than one marked in minutes. But part of this watch's appeal is its, can we go full screen there? Is its sheer hostility to its user and indifference to commercial appeal. Just look at how obtuse this bezel lock is. It's almost impossible to figure out on your first pass. The hard edged exterior, look at that. It has a first pass crudity of a prototype and practically de declares its intention to inflict some sort of injury on its user or an unlucky bystander. There isn't a single bevel on that case to blunt its clear and present danger to soft tissue. And the bubble-like sapphire encloses a quirky radial dial treatment that's only apparent when viewed from directly overhead. It's like the design team got carte blanche to create what only it and hardcore vintage Tudor devotees thought was cool, and then they did exactly that. This is the least compromised model in Tudor's catalog. It feels as crazy and impractical and uncompromised as a concept car taken direct from the show floor and deposited onto the road with no regard for the objections of accountants, engineers, and focus groups. That's not a recipe for mainstream success or commercial prosperity, but it's a wonderful middle finger to modern culture, which tends to be relentlessly commercial in every regard. One note about the future of vintage Tudor collecting. The rebound of Tudor in the last decade, uh, it's inspiring collectors to revisit the overlooked 90s and 2000s with the Tigers, the Aquanauts, or I should say the Iconauts, and the Hydronauts. And the Hydronauts are a big one because there were some great Tudor dive watches made between the end of the Submariners and the beginnings of the Black Bay and the Pelagos. These are fantastic watches that deserve to be collected on every level. They're relatively uncommon, especially in the United States. They're beautifully sized. There's nothing about that style that won't look great in 50 years and go the distance. And I think right now they're on no one's radar, which is a great time to get into any market. There's even the beefy Hydronaut 2 diving chronograph with helium escape valve. These two are uncommon and almost completely off the radar of collectors. Want to beat the 2035 vintage watch market? Get a Hydronaut 2 diving chrono now. Okay, viewer is chats number four. John B. and his grandson of three mutually appreciate the Econo LED Spider-Man wristwatch. Take that, Ublo. speaking of wrist presence. Stephen E. treats us to a rare sighting of fine 
and beautifully judged Hermes Ash Zero Wheat, this one in titanium. Albus G of Shanghai joins with his vintage 1960 Omega 14753 and one of my own in the background beyond that, maybe a 3970. What else is going on? Jason C admiring his Tudor Alinki Red Bull Racing Pelagos FXD chronograph, very topical. Well, Savannah the Bulldog frankly has other concerns. Mark R of New Zealand takes us home with one of my absolute favorites from the 2000s, the Omega Deville Retropont. Guys, send your shots to Monday Mailbag at thewatchbox.com to see your pieces on these pixels. Thanks so much to Sid on the switcher tonight. Thanks to all of you for joining me live. Uh, let's see what's going on next week. I will not be in as I will be in France with an LV event, but I will see you the Monday after that, which will be February the 12th. Until then, time out, Tim out. Thanks for logging on.